Well, good morning. Gentlemen, I have uh, some important news for you. Uh, in less than, let's see, 13 days, it will be Valentine's Day. So I'm giving you plenty of notice to get done what you need to get done. I don't want you to be caught off guard. Uh, for better or for worse this year, uh, barring an act of God, uh, I will be in the camp of people that identify the holiday as Singles Awareness Day. Uh, so, um, you know, for better or for worse, for some of us guys, it's a bit of a sad day. Uh, for others of us, we're just thankful we get to save some money, you know, uh, or spend it on ourselves, you know, buy the stuff, stuff bears for ourselves, or maybe that's just me. Uh, but if I did have a, a significant other, imagine this with me. Uh, imagine I wrote her a card, and it's real nice and thoughtful, and it says things like, oh, I love you so much, you're the only one for me, you're amazing. Right, and then imagine she sees one of her friends with the same card. And, and she, you know, is kind of curious, so she looks in to see what her significant other wrote. And it was the same handwriting, and it was also from me. And it said things like, you're amazing, you're the only one for me. Uh, you would, you know, Valentine's Day would turn into D-Day. I'd have to get out of town. Um, it would be bad. All right, and you would question the authenticity of my love for either. Um, you know, and, and, and we think of, like, Super Bowl coming up. Anybody have its fat Super Bowl parties? Anybody? Who's got the best food? Huh? Um, okay. I'll, uh, we'll talk after. But um, uh, so imagine if I showed up to a Super Bowl party. Maybe I show up to the Abbott's house. They have good food. And, uh, and I show up in a Seahawks jersey because they're diehard Seahawks fans. And, uh, and at halftime, say things aren't going so well for the Seahawks. And so I go into the restroom and change into a Patriots jersey. And, uh, and, and die hard for them. That, that would be uh, a fair weather fan, uh, and uh, it would be pretty uh, fake. Um, and so you would question my devotion to either team and whether or not I'm into any of them. First uh, John is something of a Valentine's card, uh, something of uh, uh, questioning the authenticity of our love, of our faith. It's interesting, uh, the word love is mentioned 46 times in the letter, which is amazing in a, a book that's only five chapters, filled with love, yet in all the discussion on love, John makes it clear what kind of love he's talking about. It's exclusive. It's exclusive. In fact, uh, this message today is entitled, A Love That Hates. A Love That Hates. John makes it clear that what you love will inversely reveal what you hate or what you reject. So if I really love the Seahawks, I can't also love the Patriots. Right? If I really love one thing, I've got to reject and hate something else. And we'll see what that is in this chapter. 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17. And uh, if you have any questions today, you can text them in with the number on the screen. And we'll uh, hopefully get to those at the end. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. This is God's word. Let's pray. Lord, would you help us to be people that are filled with, with the love of the Father, God, and, and have no room uh, for the love of the world, that it would have no place in our life. Will you just teach us uh, what this means? In Jesus' name, amen. Do not love the world. It's the one command in the text. And it, uh, at first glance, it could kind of seem to be a little bit at odds with John 3.16, our beloved famous verse, the verse that everybody knows. Right, Because it says, don't love the world, but John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world. And so we've got to try to reconcile this. How, uh, God loves the world. He loves uh, 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 the world and he wants us to love like he does. And yet, 1 John says, don't love the world. And these aren't like different Johns, right? It's the same John writing these things. Uh, and we can resolve this in a couple ways, but I think we start with the word world. The Greek word's cosmos. It can refer to the cosmology, right? The universe, stars. 
It can refer to the earth, the planet. It can refer to people, human culture. It can also refer to the godless system fully infused with sin and influenced by Satan. Or in uh, worded another way, any system or way of thinking and living which promotes ultimate personal fulfillment apart from God. Right? So with de- this definition, we see that the world, this system, uh, is not just the bad stuff. Right? It's also the good stuff without God, with him not involved. But I think the most important question as we look at these two verses and as we look at uh, what John is talking about uh, is the question, what is love? Right? And that song comes to my head. Uh, I forgot who wrote it. That, what is love? Baby, don't hurt me. You know, so, somebody was asking the question. And, uh, you know, and so I'm going to try to answer it. John tried to answer it. Um, it's unfortunate. And this is probably why that dumb song was written. I always remember it in the skating rink when we had skate nights or whatever. Um, and it was really annoying. Uh, but this word in English, love, it, it often refers more to preference or likings, right? I, I love pizza. Uh, I love the Seahawks. I love this kind of music. I love Dutch Bros. Right? I love your new hair. Uh, it's all preference, likings. But in the Bible, the definition of love is, uh, as far as I know, not like that. It's not about preference. Uh, instead, as John Stott brilliantly puts it, the love of the Bible is not an uncontrollable emotion, but a steady devotion of the will. A steady devotion of the will. Not primarily feelings, but commitment to something. Longevity. And that could be for the positive or the negative. Right? You could love, you could be committed to and devoted to the wrong things. So from here, it seems to me that we can resolve John 3.16 and 1 John 2.15 uh, by talking about John 3.16 uh, is God's love for the world. And, and, and world is in the people. Right, we know that because it's whosoever believes. It's not referring to anything else but to people. And then in 1 John 2.15, it's talking about two different kinds of loves. Right? If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Two different kinds of loves. But in the first love, the love of the world is, is the selfish love of participation. The selfish love of participation. The second love, the John 3.16 kind of love, the love of the Father is the holy love of redemption. It's selfless, right? Selfish versus selfless. Godless versus godlike. Lust versus love. And it's the selfish love of participation that that's what John's commanding against. It's a worldly love that's demonstrated by, in verse 16, it says, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. So two general categories, desire and lust, and pride. Uh, So desire and lust being for what we don't have, and that can refer to sexual sin, but so much bigger than that. It's anything and everything we're looking to, uh, to ultimately fulfill us. Things that we think that we need. Pride, on the other hand, pride in what we do have, right? Pride in our possessions, accomplishments, desire, lust, and pride. Both different ways of showing that the Father is not our ultimate focus. We're looking to something else, something we want or something that we have. And that is what John calls as worldly. And so there's the command, don't love the world. And if you're like me, I want reasons. Give me some reasons, John. And so he says, okay, I've got two reasons for you. And I think they're pretty good. The first is that love for the world pushes out love for God. Love for the world pushes out love for God. Matthew 22, 37. Right, the greatest commandment out of all the 600 plus commandments of the Old Testament. He, he, when, when scribes ask Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? He gives them this one. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And isn't that great? That, that God's not looking primarily to your resume. And how good you are. But he's looking for your heart. His concern isn't about your performance. Or or how long your streak is. Or your track record. As much as he wants your heart. Your trust. Your love. 
So then the battle for our hearts becomes vital because as Jesus says in uh, Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Right? It's not just money, though that example is huge and we ought to listen to that. Right? You can't serve God in sports. You can't serve God in success. You can't serve God in your physical appearance. You can't serve God in politics, God in academics, God in the praise of people. Ultimately, you cannot serve God and something else. Right? And are any of these things bad in their proper place? No. But there's only one, one first place podium in my heart. There's only room for one person to be on the throne or one thing to be on the throne of my heart. Matthew Henry says it like this. The heart of a man is narrow and cannot contain both loves. The world draws down the heart from God. And so the more the love of the world prevails, the more the love of God dwindles and decays. The world is a usurper of our affection. Right? It just sucks it away. It's fitting that John would end his letter, 1 John 5.21, with this, Dear children, keep yourself from idols. Uh, four years ago, um, my very first sermon here at River Valley was on this verse. Dear children, keep yourself from idols. And uh, it was because it was on December 26th, 2010. And it was, uh, I think they let me teach then because it was the day after Christmas. And they thought no one would show up, you know. So it's like, oh, thanks, Dad, you know. Um, but uh, all that to say, uh, this verse is just as convicting and challenging and important to me today as it was then. And I don't feel like I've even grown so much because this is, this is huge. It's a huge issue. As uh, John Calvin said, the human heart's an idle factory. And as I've said over and over again, and some of you guys might roll your eyes because I say it all the time, idols are so often good things that we make the ultimate thing. Right? Consider some examples. Maybe the, the single person who desires to be married. Not a bad desire in and of itself, but when the desire gets distorted and becomes ultimate and becomes the main goal, you start trampling on people to get there. And, and you start seeing people as means to an end. You start uh, compromising in various ways. Right? Or consider academics, athletics, any other activities. Right? Great things, but when these things cause us to put more emphasis on them than on God, we've made them an idol. And at best, we're going to burn our kids out or give them misguided priorities. Right? At worst, our kids won't know God and will lose their soul. Idols are so destructive. Loving the world is so destructive. Right? And it's not that God's saying, you gotta, you got to stop loving the world because I don't want you to have fun. Right? I don't want you to go to parties because uh, they're fun and I'm about stealing your fun and I'm a killjoy. Uh, it's so much not what, what it's about. Loving God is life-giving. That's where the life is found. It's what we were made for. Paul had a ministry companion called uh, Demas. And in uh, 2 Timothy 4.10, uh, Paul says, Demas has deserted me, but for he loves this present world. Uh, uh, I don't know what Demas specifically uh, was into or what his sin was. It might have been... A particular sin, I kind of think it was comfort that he just, you know, got tired of the ministry demands and left. Was he saved? I don't know. I'm not going to name my kid Demas, you know. Uh, it kind of sounds like demon too, and so, but um, Demas uh, was in love with the present world, left Paul, and probably regretted it, whether it's eternally or temporarily. I love what John Piper said, and I think I'm going to steal it, and maybe I won't quote him next time, uh, and you'll think it's me. Uh, but he says, uh, my whole life is dedicated to helping people fall out of love of the world and into love for God. So John gives us two reasons. First, love for the world pushes out love for God. Two, the world is passing away or fading away, as some translations say, gradually growing faint to disappear. Uh, anybody investing in VHS technology right now? Eight tracks, anybody? No? Um, uh, I mean, nobody with sense invests in a company that's going to go bankrupt. 
right? Unless they're, you know, wheeling and dealing illegally or something. Uh, nobody sets up house on a sinking ship. Uh, no football team, right? No, the, the Patriots and the Seahawks, they aren't buying 50-year-old players. Uh, I don't think, you know. Uh, surely nobody was sense would invest in something that's going down. Right? Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy or where aging destroys or where time destroys but where thieves break in and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thief, thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. This world is passing away. It's a poor investment. Right? And to set your heart on it is only asking for heartache and misery in the end. Right? As the song says, sinking sand. Not only that, but verse 17 says the world and its desires are passing away. So not only uh, will we lose our money or our investments, not only will we lose this world, but if we're ultimately invested in it, we go down with it as well. Right? It's like the captain of the Titanic. He goes down with the ship. If we are invested in the world in the ultimate sense, we will go down with it as well. Simeon, the new theologian, uh, I don't know who the old one was, but I uh, just found him in a book. Uh, he said, let us flee the world. For what have we got in common with it? Let us run and pursue until we have laid hold of something which is permanent and does not pass away. For all things perish and pass away like a dream, and nothing is lasting or certain among things which are seen. So I guess the question is, how do we know if we're in love with the world? How do we know if that's pushing out our love for God and if we're investing in something that's going to fade? Four suggestions, and they're not going to be on the screen. Uh, Thoughts, money, time, and emotions. Thoughts, money, time, and emotions. Thoughts. What do you think about when you have nothing to think about? It's often a great sign of where your heart really is. Right? It's time. Or, or no, money. Uh, money. Where does your money go? Usually a great indicator of what's important to you. Your time. How do you spend your time? We all have to work. We all have to go to school and, and that stuff. But... Uh, especially that free time. How do we spend that? Uh, and emotions. What just gets you riled up? What gets you so excited and pumped up? Can be a good indicator uh, if you're more in love with the world than God. In stark contrast to the world passing away, it says in verse 17, whoever does the will of God abides forever. Or abideth if you have the King James. Abides forever. And what's the will of God? First uh, John uh, three twenty three. I think the screen says four twenty three, but um, it's not right. Three twenty three uh, says this, and this is His commandment that we believe in the name of His Son Jesus Christ and love one another. How cool is it that out of all the commandments uh, in the New Testament, we get one. We get one in this place. And it's just to believe in the name of His Son Jesus Christ. And then love one another. Notice it says commandment, not commandments. Those aren't two things you do to get saved. You, you do one, you believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. And love for one another is natural. You experience God's love for you vertically. Then you extend it horizontally to others. Okay? To believe, to trust the name of Jesus. Right? By faith, recognizing who he is for you, his love for you. Right? The most loving command ever given. Look to me. Trust the name of my son. Trust everything he is and represents. Trust his sinless life and death for sinners like you and I. Trust him and live. Trust him by ultimately only loving him. And then extending that selfless love to others and to the world. The love of the Father. Maybe you're here today and you feel like your love for the Father's grown cold. Would you recognize that his love for you has not grown cold? And that as we recognize his continual love and commitment to us, uh, that our love for him would grow and we would push out the love for the world. Or maybe you're here and you've never truly trusted and loved God ultimately. Right? You, all you've known is love for the world. And would you see that, that the world is passing away? 
and the one who does the will of God, the one who believes in him and believes in his son, endures forever. He wants to save us from that life, from the sinking ship that is the Titanic of this world, and to pull us onto the lifeboat that's Jesus. It's more than sufficient for everybody, more than enough lifeboats uh, for us to be saved. So I'm going to read the verse one more time over you and just invite you to close your eyes and let God's Spirit speak to you. 1 John 2.15-17 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Father, would we be people that are so filled with the love of you uh, that we have no room for the love of the world. We have no room uh, for other uh, people and, and things uh, taking that ultimate spot that only you deserve, Lord. The front and center of our focus. God, and as we focus on you, would you then teach us what the love of the Father looks like as it's not just me and God, or, uh, but it, it extends to others and it loves other people. It loves the church. It loves the lost. So God, would we be so filled with your love uh, that uh, it's all we want and it's all we need. In Jesus' name, amen.